John chapter 1 and verse 18, which says that no man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. I take this verse to mean that God here is the Heavenly Father, the creator of heaven and earth, who is in heaven and who cannot be seen because he dwells in light and approachable. That's what 1 Timothy chapter 6 tells us, that it is the Lord Jesus Christ uh, at his appearing who will show us uh, the God who only hath immortality dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. So God cannot be seen, but the Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, hath declared him. The only begotten Son, Jesus. In which way is he the only begotten Son? Luke chapter 1 verse 35 tells us that the Holy Spirit would come upon Mary. The power of the highest would overshadow her. Therefore, also, Jesus would be called the Son of God. Jesus is the Son of God because he was born by the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit uh, upon the Virgin Mary. Now, that's the understanding of this verse that I have. But if you use a, a modern version, uh, you find something quite different. And this might come as something of a surprise because in the English Standard Version, instead of having the only begotten Son, we have the only God. In the New International Version, instead of the only begotten Son, we have the one and only Son who is himself God. And in the Net Bible, we have the only one himself God. That's really important to address this question because there's a, there's a huge difference between the concept that Jesus is the Son of God, the unique Son of God, born by the power of the Holy Spirit on a virgin, and Jesus, God the Son, part of the Trinity. Jesus as the Son of God, a real man who could really be tempted, uh, shows the amazing victory that he had over sin. And he could really die. He did really die. And he rose again from the dead. But Jesus as God the Son, how could he really have shared our human nature? How could he really have been tempted? How could he really have died? So it's a really important subject and we need to look into it. Why are the modern versions the way they are? What has changed? To answer this, we have to go to delve into the history of the New Testament documents. The original letters written by the apostles and the gospels written by the gospel writers were written on papyrus, on, on delicate form of paper written in Greek and circulated to Christi Christian communities uh, uh, across the the region and those letters themselves would have been copied and those copies would themselves have been copied but the very earliest documents just wouldn't have survived very long at all except in very rare occasions in climates such as in Egypt so mainly we have later documents uh, hundreds of years after the New Testament we've got about five or six thousand surviving handwritten documents of those those uh, first uh, epistles and gospels dating occasionally from within 100 years it seems of the original to several hundred years and these documents they're not all identical in the text they have variations of spelling sometimes spelling mistakes sometimes other little minor errors experts in new testament tell us that there are very few of these variations that would change anything of our understanding these little changes allow the texts to be grouped together in families of of manuscripts suggesting perhaps a great grandparent that is common to them but mostly it doesn't really matter occasionally it does and one variant which exists which is important is this John 1 18 where most manuscripts have the son and a few have God how can we sort this out well if we go to uh, the way in which John 1 verse 18 was quoted by early church leaders within one two three hundred years of the New Testament times they do quote John 1.18 on quite a lot of occasions. 
far more uses of son than of God. But both readings were around at the time. There were some documents, presumably, which read God and some which read son. But it's interesting that one that struck, uh, caught my eye was uh, the writing of Athanasius, who was a main proponent of Trinitarianism. And he uses the word son, not God, when he quotes that same word. And you'd think, you know, that if he was trying to support the development of this new doctrine of the Trinity, that he would have been grateful that there was a verse in the Bible that might have supported his case. But he doesn't. He uses son. Another very interesting finding is that Jerome, around about 400, uh, who was asked by the Pope to translate into Latin from the Greek New Testament, and he produced what was the main Bible of the Catholic Church for you know, more than a thousand years. Jerome chose to use the word son, not God, uh, in the Latin version. And again, as a Trinitarian, you would think he would have no problem in using the only begotten God, if he really thought that was the true rendering of the case. But this is the Vulgate. This is what he uses. Unigenitus filius, the only begotten son. I think that's quite striking. When we come to the early English translations, they were based on only a few of these New Testament manuscripts, and they were mainly from the, well, they were all from the Byzantine family of texts, and they just had the only begotten son, uh, and that was, that was straightforward. What really changed everything was the discovery of this codex called uh, Codex Sinaiticus in 1859, discovered in Egypt, where papyrus manuscripts can survive in, in that climate if they're not uh, worn out by use. And this codex in 1859 had the only begotten God, not the only begotten Son. And scholars thought, still think most of them, that this codex is, is the oldest full uh, copy of the New Testament, and it is closest to the original. That's their, their judgment. That's their opinion. And it's on that basis that modern translations have adopted this new rendering. So they follow the uh, a revised Greek text, which has been revised on the basis mainly of Codex Sinaiticus. And you, but you notice, you notice if you look at your ESV or your NIV Bible, there'll be a footnote against that phrase: "The only begotten God," or whatever way they render it. And it'll say some manuscripts have some. Some manuscripts have some. And I, I think that's quite strange, really, to say just some, because when you look at the statistics, as far as I can glean, there are 17 manuscripts which have some. 1,600 do not. So 17 manuscripts. I, sorry, I misspoke there. 17 manuscripts have God. And 1,600 have son. So the statistics are hugely weighted in favor of son, not God. And I think that is quite interesting. To say in the footnote, some manuscripts don't really convey uh, the, the statistics that, that uh, are out there. And I also think it's quite interesting that there is a, a new version published in 2017 of the New Testament, Greek, by Tyndall House in Cambridge. Tyndall House is a, a research institute, a evangelical research institute in Cambridge, and they fully believe in the Trinity, so they're not biased uh, against the Trinity in, in any way at all. And their New Testament version says, applying latest methods of detecting scribal mistakes developed by John Kind and others and comparing their results with groups in Germany and the USA and with Erasmus uh, that have different editorial philosophies, they've come up with this new version. And their version has son, not God. And I think that's very, very interesting. Right? The only begotten son, not the only begotten God. So that's the external evidence. What about the internal evidence? 
Well, I, I think this is really important because Codex Sinaiticus, to my mind, has got at least three problems with it. Firstly, uh, it's full of errors of all sorts. It's not a really good copy in, in many respects. Uh, it's a, a question mark. How reliable is it really? Was it used or was it not used? Has it survived because people didn't bother to use it to copy from because they didn't consider it to be a particularly good version? Second question. It may be quite old, and maybe it is the oldest, you know, substantial version. But newer manuscripts uh, may have been copied from even older manuscripts. So just because we have uh, an, a relatively new manuscript doesn't tell us uh, how old the original copy was that that manuscript came from. And then my third question about it is, is it? And we know this sometimes happens, the texts are deliberately changed to support a particular view. And the question is, at the time in which Codex Sinaiticus was being uh, composed, uh, there was a hot debate about the Trinity in Alexandria. And it is rather curious that it is from Alexandria that this text has emerged. The internal evidence uh, is overwhelming, I think, in terms of sun. Jesus is the son of God. That's what John tells us all the time. And son fits the context perfectly. That's what John is talking about. And if you go to John chapter 3, verse 16, John chapter 3, verse 18, all the versions have only begotten son. All of them have only begotten son. Only begotten God is just a, a one-off if, it, if it's true. But if it, it doesn't make sense. How, how can it make sense? Uh, how can uh, you say that no man has seen God, but the only God has made him known. The only God who was seen, Jesus. I, I couldn't explain that verse. If, if that was true, it, it just wouldn't make sense. So just in the context, the only begotten son makes perfect sense. The other does not. But to me, the clincher is this. If you look at the phrase, no one has seen God at any time, what John 1.18 is doing is taking us back to Exodus chapter 33. In Exodus chapter 33, Moses has just brought Israel out to the promised land. Uh, he's come to Mount Sinai. God has revealed himself on Mount Sinai. The, the glory of God has uh, come down upon the mountain. Uh, Moses has received the Ten Commandments and the law. But Moses wants to know more, and he says to God, uh, Show me your glory. And, and God says, you cannot see my face. No man shall see me and live. This is what John 1 verse 18 is talking about. No one has seen God. You can't see God and live. But the only begotten son has revealed him. And if you look at uh, John 1, you'll see several references back to Exodus chapter 33, when Moses says, show me thy glory, John says, we saw his glory. We beheld his glory. Well, how can that be? Because Moses was told, no man can see me and live. John 1.18 says, no man can see God. But the glory that John is speaking of is the glory of God's character. And what happens in Exodus chapter 34 is that God's glory was proclaimed to Moses. So the angel passes by Moses, who's put in a cleft in the rock, and a voice proclaims, right? Jesus has declared or proclaimed. This is what has taken us back to, which says that the Lord is merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. That's what Moses heard. The Lord is abundant in goodness and truth. And what John is saying is, you know, that what Moses heard, we saw Jesus full of grace and truth, abundant in grace and truth, abundant in goodness and truth. What Moses couldn't see, but only hear, we have seen in Jesus, the glory of God's character revealed to us in a living being, the only begotten son of God. This is the glorious truth of what John is telling us, a wonderful expression of, of the truth of God. See, Jesus could say at the end of his ministry in John chapter 17, I have manifested thy name. I have given them thy words and the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them. Jesus is not God. 
Jesus is the son of God, as the Bible teaches. But if we want to know what God is like, we must see Jesus, his life, his works, his words, because he has declared to us in all these ways the glory of God, the graciousness and truth of the Father, working through his son to redeem us from sin and to reconcile us to him. In Jesus, we find fellowship with the Father and with the Son. And in the kingdom to come, by God's grace, we will be one in nature as well. Mm -hmm.